Welcome, I'm Professor Alex Roberts. I don't usually sound like this. I managed to lose my voice um, at a conference that we were just having on intellectual property law. So um, I'm just going to give some really brief opening remarks, and then a friend is going to help me out and read my additional remarks, and I uh, really appreciate that. So welcome to this event celebrating Sharon Hood why we should think before we talk about our kids online. Um, I am so proud, so very proud of my friend and colleague, Leah Plunkett, right over there, um, and so amazed to see how quickly this project came to fruition. So I remember walking around White Park with her and her initially sharing the news. Oh, I wanted to tell you I'm writing a book. And I was like, what? Um, and then all of a sudden the book was here, and it is... If you haven't read the book yet, it is profoundly terrifying, but in a productive way. It's a fascinating exploration of all the ways that by sharing images and data in the present, we may be compromising our children's futures. Tonight, we will hear from Professor Lucy Hodder, director of our health law program, and Professor Mike McCann, where'd you go? There we go. Um, director of the Sports and Entertainment Law Institute on topics related to sharenting, and you'll hear all about what sharenting is. And then Dean Carpenter will interview Dean Plunkett, and we'll open up for kind of general Q&A, and then we'll head downstairs for some dessert. Um, I would like to thank Marianne Aspel. She's not here tonight, but she was incredibly helpful in, in putting this event together and making it possible. And the Rudman Center for Social Justice and the Sports and Entertainment Law Institute for their support and um, Professor Nicholson Price of the University of Michigan for being my voice tonight when I really don't have one. Um, so I think Professor McCann, would you be willing to kick it off? Sure. Fantastic. So we're all a little bit injured. I have a sprained ankle, so we're all trying. I guess everyone up here is going to have some sort of impairment. That's going to be the theme. Uh, <laughs> Well, first off, uh, Professor Roberts, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, you mentioned thanking a number of people, but we should thank you because uh, Professor Roberts took the lead and organized this and put everything together. So we thank you for, for doing that with no voice as well. Makes it even more impressive. And I'm also incredibly thrilled by Dean Leah Plunkett's uh, inviting me to be part of this. And if you haven't read Sharon Hood, hopefully you have, it, it, this is nonstop. You cannot, you cannot put it down, and I mean that. It is so compelling. It is frightening, but it's frightening in a way that you want to keep turning the page. And this is a book that has been re uh, reviewed extremely well by major publications, The New Yorker, Wired, the Boston Globe. The Boston Globe magazine even did a whole uh, excerpt of it. So this is a book that is getting a ton of attention, and deservedly so, because it really talks about it. I know uh, the deans will talk about it in their one-on-one -on -one interview, but the role of parents in monitoring how children share information, which sounds straightforward, but as you know from the book, isn't at all. And the idea that we're leaving behind traces of information that can be used by others for profit or, or worse, potentially, and that children really don't have a say in this because it's their parents doing it, right? It's, you can't tell your parents, stop it if you're 11 years old, right? And they want to go on Facebook and, and put all those photos. We know it, we see it. And the trace, the, the permanent digital trace that's being left is something that's of, of great concern. And as uh, Leah notes in the book, these are adult decisions, and they accelerate the growth, if you will, of a child from being a child into a parent, but not in a way that perhaps is intended or foreseen by the parent. And we see it in all walks of life. And of course, part of this relates to child labor laws that traditionally have governed, that long, a long time ago, allowed kids to work in factories allowed young people to work, if, if any of you, uh, some of you may, I mean, I, I'm Irish, so I remember they would work in the mills in Lowell at very young ages. 
And nowadays, of course, we have child safety laws that prevent that sort of thing. But what I want to talk about is sharenting in the context of sports, youth sports in particular, but I'll pivot to adult sports as I go on. So this is, I want to begin by talking about the parent who puts their son and daughter's athletic achievement on Facebook, on Instagram, well-intentioned, right? Their kid did something, they hit the home run, they were able to lead their basketball team to victory, the softball team won, they can throw a javelin far, whatever it may be. And parents, I think, are in part motivated by the belief that their child may be a superior athlete, right? A lot of kids seem athletic, but as time goes on, they realize they're not. Uh, some of you may have, I, I know as a kid, I was really good at tennis. And I was like, oh, I'm totally gonna make it. And then reality comes. <laughs> and you go to the next level and everyone's faster and taller and stronger and quicker. And you kind of get weeded out. It's life. But nowadays, that journey happens online, which is a little different, right? The idea that people can say, what happened? Why are you no longer playing a sport? Some parents, I think, are motivated by the belief that their child will become a college athlete and get an athletic scholarship. And they may hear a stat that, that tells them, oh, we totally have to do this. $2.7 billion every year goes towards athletic scholarships in college. 2.7, that's billion with a B. That sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Except less than 2% of college students in the United States have an athletic scholarship. It's a little, it's between one and 2%. In other words, almost everyone in college is not there on an athletic scholarship. So the idea that this is gonna pay off down the line is, is you can question. Also, even if the odds are beaten, and the child becomes a college athlete, the vast majority of the time it's a partial scholarship, not a full scholarship. You hear somebody got an athletic scholarship, you're thinking full ride. Yeah, maybe if they're gonna go play in the WNBA one day or the NFL, but that's not most people, right? In fact, the average athletic scholarship last year, 18,000. A lot of money, but if you look at how much it costs to go to college, that's less than half. In fact, it could be less than a third if you include just day-to-day -day expenses that people incur going to college. It's not a great, not a great trade-off. They're probably better off studying. And we have to think, when we think of Sharon Hood, really putting photos online of kids playing sports, does that lead them in a direction that certainly has positive attributes? It's good to play sports. You, you learn teammate skills, more likely to stay fit. Those are all good things but does it lead you away from other activities that might be more beneficial? We can wonder. Some parents use social media with sports to complain. This is the parent who says, I, he, Timmy wasn't out, the umpire's so bad, right? Or why doesn't Jane play more? What's wrong with the coach? It's a coaching issue, not a player issue. And we have seen parents go online and put things that are you know, frankly embarrassing, right? It embarrasses the parent, probably embarrasses the child. I couldn't, I would be horrified if my parents were online putting why doesn't, why doesn't Michael play, why doesn't he get more playing time? Well, maybe because he isn't good enough, right? That's sort of, <laughs> you know, that's probably the, the real reason. It's been said, if you wouldn't say it in front of a coach with your kid there, or if you wouldn't say it in front of the athletic director or the principal, don't put it online. And that certainly goes to Sharon Hood, right? Using the same test that you would use in front of someone before you put that thing online. And the thing is, you put it online, it's there forever. It's even worse, you could argue. If you tell someone in person, maybe there's no recording of it. But online, that's not the case. And to the extent parents use social media, many experts say, use it to encourage the team, not the player. Let it be about the team, accentuate the positive attributes of the team, don't criticize the opponents, certainly don't criticize specific players either on the team or on the opposing team. You know, we wonder why there's so much bullying today, and I've, certainly beyond my knowledge, but you gotta think they go online and they see what they see, right? They see the hot takes on social media, they see you know, people trying to incite arguments and ridicule. 
I mean, I'm not an expert, but I would think that that plays some role in what we're seeing today in terms of bullying. There are also privacy issues with parents putting photos online of their children. Sharon Hood, and I'm sure this will come up in the discussion, really goes into both the legal and ethical issues involved with sharing photos online of your child, be it in sports or be it in some other activity. We also know that in sports, there's real commercial value with putting photos online of athletes. We know that there's real value with names, images, and likenesses. There have been lawsuits over this. Taking a college athlete's identity, putting it into a video game, and not sharing the money with the athlete. That this isn't unique to uh, other topics. This happens in sports as well. Now, there have been video games with college players where the electronic arts literally stripped the player's name right before publication and then sold the game for 60 bucks. And they had the player's race, age, weight, left or right-handedness, hometown, whether the player is good or bad. Uh, this kind of fits into the same narrative, right, of what we're sharing and who is, who's to gain, who gains from it. Now, it's interesting that, that we think about parents sharing information and the impact on college sports because it's very different in other countries. There is no NCAA in Europe or in Africa or in Asia. In those parts of the world, when do you turn pro? Anyone know? When you're good enough. We have that here with acting, right? And musicians. You know, John Mayer wasn't disallowed from signing a recording contract because he was a freshman at the Berkeley School of Music. I think the Olsen twins made 150 million. By the, I, I don't know how, that's, how that happened, but whatever. <laughs> but by the time they were 16, there's a stat out there. You know, we don't say, oh, you can't go make money if you're an actor or if you're a musician. But if you're an athlete, our rules are totally different. If you want to be an NFL player, you have to play, you have to be three years out of high school. Three years. And during that time, you might blow out your knee, right? And if you're a running back, you probably only have so many rushes in those legs. Basketball players. The WNBA has a very restrictive age limit. You have to be, if you're American, if you're American, you have to be a college graduate or 22. But if you're an international player, you only have to be 20. Why the distinction? Because they're already pros when they're teenagers. There's no college sports issue. Sharon Hood also is relevant to the Varsity Blues scandal. Varsity Blues, as many of you know, is a scandal involving parents with the fake athlete as the child. Right? This, is the op this is not the superior athlete who isn't paid. This is the non-athlete who gets to go to a college that they wouldn't have gotten into otherwise. And of course, Varsity Blues goes beyond fake athleticism. We know from the prosecutions that the parents hired ringers to take the standardized tests. There's a 38-year-old person. Like, all he did was take standardized tests. So you get good at it right? if you keep taking the same test over and over again. Uh, Felicity Huffman is involved with this, Lori Laughlin. Those are the big names, but there are others. And this relates to how they used social media to promote their children. They actually created fake websites, fake athletic profiles that were shared online. So in that context, the sharing was to try to dupe people, which is sort of a twist on what parents normally do, right? They're normally trying to promote their kid with genuine photos, but in that context, it was Let's present a story that isn't actually true. And then the last part I would say is, if any of you become an agent, and some of our students have gone on to become sports, we have an NFL agent here in New Hampshire. He graduated a few years ago. And what you do as an agent is the first thing, go check your client's social media pages. Because a number of players fail to do that, and their agents fail to do it, and there have been players who are punished for racist, racist uh, sexist, homophobic, and other awful things that they've put on their pages. Now, deleting the stuff from their page doesn't get at the core issue, like why would you put it up, which is probably the more important thing. But when kids are 13 and 14, and now they can go online, uh, they can say stupid things. And an agent, if any of you become an agent, the good agents try to scrub 
the pages as much as they can. And again, it doesn't address the underlying problem of why they, those posts were put up. But at the very least, it mitigates what could happen to the athlete, not only in terms of his or her employment contract, but also endorsement deals. Right? That's where a lot of the money is. And I know my time is up. Thank you very much. Um, it is such an honor to be here, and congratulations, Leah Plunkett, um, for this incredibly relevant, current, um, thought-provoking book. My name is Lucy Hodder, and I'm the Director of Health Law and Policy here at the Law School. Uh, and I teach health law, and I run the certificate program, and I also work at the Institute for Health Policy and Practice. And this book, I'm going to try and keep it very brief. It brings up so many issues that are relevant in the healthcare space that it's hard to know where to stop and start. Um, but I just want to read one of those quotes from this book, um, which just got me. Um, she says, the digital world remembers. It's set up to remember. But it needs to learn how to forget the silly, stupid, and sensitive things kids and teens do, especially when adults are choosing whether to record them. I think that says so much. Um, so I am, I'm a mother uh, as well. So let me tell you, I have a 21-year-old and a 24-year-old. And I can, even in their lifetime, how much is shared and what's shared uh, has changed dramatically. And um, this book says so much. And it, yes, it's scary. But what it, I felt like as I was reading the history of watching these kids come of age in this kind of a setting where they're creating with parents who have no idea. I went to high school, just to date me, when we used typewriters, OK? And um, I didn't, when I first got to the Attorney General's office in New Hampshire, we were do, using internal computers, uh, email only, with Wang systems. So. This has all happened. And then five years ago, when I was working for Governor Hassan as her legal counsel and the director of health, um, uh, her chief health policy advisor, I was supposed to, I remember this is someone who typed in high school, I was supposed to be speaking and testifying while watching the Twitter feed real time as to what people were saying about what I was saying on her behalf and editing the news you know, blurbs that were going out from our office about what was happening. I mean, it, 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 the, the degree to which this has um, happened real time so quickly is astounding. So think about this in the healthcare space. A mother writes a tribute to her recovery from postpartum depression on her Facebook site. We've all seen that. A family member posts a photo visiting a child after an accident when the child's in the hospital smiling in the bed with their leg hanging up, right, in a cast. Friends, all posting with each other, um, or families, uh, their health and vital indicators in their training website. And what about those wellness apps that are recording everything? I was listening the other night to, there's somebody who has decided to take this, who can take with blockchain, as Tanya uh, Evans, who's our blockchain expert, is taking information and allowing individuals to say, yes, take my information, package it, and sell it. So they're trying to be the broker for all of the personal information that people have to prevent it from being taken by somebody else. They're packaging it and actually selling the information to users. Think about um, when uh, Professor Plunkett mentions in her book, this was another getcha moment, she talks about applying to college, all right, and these faux tyke bites. And she defines a tyke bite as your child's passport from her past to her future, as sort of this you know, futuristic concept that a tyke bite could be all that information about your kid packaged for college. Well, that happens in healthcare. We already have feed upon feed of different areas where our healthcare information is being stored. That's not far away. So she. She actually talks about how maybe in this world of the vast amount of knowledge, and let's talk about healthcare knowledge, maybe the parents should be the first source of regulatory oversight. So let's talk about it in that context. 
Because I can't help but think of real life examples in my work at the Institute that I have thought about in the last month, okay? Goal Mama. Goal Mama is software that actually supports women um, in, who are having babies, mostly Medicaid women, who may have experienced substance use disorder. So the concept is, what kind of technology, if they're developing a plan of safe care for recovery, for social supports, for support in the, in the community, what kind of um, technology can support them? So Goal Mama is a, is a partnership between Hope Lab in California and the Nurse Family Partnership to help moms in recovery with their support. So it allows them to text their case manager really easily and brings together all their information, okay, on a cell phone. How about um, event notification software? Um, and risk stratification software, sharing care management software. So all of the healthcare industry is worried about how to risk stratify, how, how, how much of a patient you are at risk for further health issues. That's all we're talking about. How do you find which patients are gonna be most likely to cost us the most? And what software is gonna help us find them? Taking all the information we have and trying to figure out where are we gonna target our care plans? And where are we going to target our, our changes in the way we deliver health care so that those patients who have bring the most risk to who they are, we can go out and capture? We're doing that right now. We have software all over the place um, trying to figure out how to do that. Um, or how about this? We had a work requirement associated with, with our Medicaid program. And all the providers were trying to figure out how do you go find these people in the community to tell them they have a work requirement? Okay, you go through the claims data, you go through their medical records, you find out who might be at risk or involved in the Medicaid program, and then you go find them. All of this access to information, everyone's trying to figure out how to pull it all together and how to use it uh, with little or no regulation. Okay, so let's think about who does regulate. Because Leah Plunkett has suggested that the parents should at least be some sort of regulators. Who else? Um, wellness apps. No one really regulates wellness apps, okay? Clinical decision-making support software. We have the FDA and, and uh, Nicholson Price will suggest they're actually doing a pretty good job. This month they've come out with about three different uh, regulatory frameworks for looking at clinical support software. It's fascinating. How are they gonna determine whether to regulate it? They look, they now, just, just now, this month, developed a patient risk framework for looking at that. Then we have CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Transformation, uh, Center, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, who are regulating um, electronic health records. Totally separate agency. Are health, health records and electronic health re records interoperable? Do they do what they're supposed to do? None of them do yet. Um, and they're all supposed to be interoperable sharing all over the place. It's a separate regulatory agency. And then there's claims data. Claims data is actually regulated by the U.S. Department of Labor, okay? Uh, or maybe your local insurance department um, may regulate some of the claims data. So you have all of this different sources of information. No one has really figured out how to regulate it, um, and all of it includes very personal information. We basically believe in our healthcare data that you shouldn't use it to stigmatize people. I think we all agree on that. You know, the other general consensus which um, Professor Plunkett identifies in her book is you probably don't want it commercialized. So that's another sort of common thread is how do you keep it from being commercialized against your will? You know, and finally, how do you deal with children and what they're responsible for and their parents and what are they responsible for? Um, and even in some circumstances in healthcare, we give the children a lot more responsibility than the parents. So sexually transmitted diseases um, or uh, uh, recovery supports um, around substance use, we give children a lot more age of consent um, responsibility around their ability to access treatment without um, the consent of their, their parents and therefore the ability to say yes, you can share my information or no, you can't share my information. Uh, depending on how old they are. So that's a very long-winded way of saying that this book and this conversation 
brings up so many relevant issues in the healthcare space around what we're sharing and how that's combined to make decisions about healthcare and who really regulates that so we can go from the um, sort of mundane, you know, are you parent, what pictures of your kids to post, to the really philosophical of how do we manage um, stigmatization, commercialization, um, and then the need to share for public health and care reasons, the real need to share and combine information. I don't know if you saw the signs about the Infant Mortality uh, Commission that's meeting here on Monday. We can't even get them the information they need because of privacy issues. So we have this huge spectrum of conflicting social values around sharing. Um, and if only parents uh, and children could sit and decide and make the ultimate decisions as to what's shared. But we've got a lot more decisions to make about how we want to manage the confidentiality of health information, which is right now everywhere. So this is a fantastic book. So privileged to be here and be able to talk about it and everyone read it. And the conversations about it will be ongoing forever over time. So thank you, Leah. So I haven't read the book, uh, and I'm not a parent, but I, I just, I couldn't resist giving you some of my own thoughts on this issue. No, I'm totally kidding. Of course I can resist, uh, because helpfully, Professor Roberts has written some useful remarks, and I'll just read what she wrote, because she actually knows what she's talking about, actually. <clears throat> Reading Leah's book, I was torn about whether to share my thoughts as a mother or as a legal expert in things like false advertising and regulation of influencer marketing. Discussions about sharenting hit extremely close to home. As a parent, I think about small questions like, should I avoid posting this photo of my baby in a diaper to Instagram? Should I refuse to sign this release of toddler music class to share pictures of my child on their website? Is it safe to post this personal question in one of my closed Facebook parenting groups? Professor Plunkett's book adds so many questions. What about the data collected by the baby app that tracks diapers and feeds? What about Alexa, Next, and other surveillance devices? What about transmitting health info over pediatricians' online services? Facial recognition, shopping accounts, disclosing kids' personal information in connection with school and other activities, photos and videos, eh, photos and videos stored in the cloud, and more. And Professor Plunkett's book also zooms out. It risks, or it talks about risks that include not just exposure to child predators, but identity theft, credit fraud, disclosure of health information that can affect access to insurance, loss of opportunity. She gives this terrific example of a young child bullied by his parents on YouTube and taken from their custom custody. Other parents might say he's now at high risk for mental health issues. Do we want our kid playing with him? Schools might say, do we want him enrolling? Employers might discriminate in hiring based on those videos. Broadly, the book reminds us the millions of ways we unintentionally or unwittingly share data and personal information about our kids. It's categorized as a parenting book, and as a parent, I can tell you it's a terrifying and mortifying catalog of all I've done wrong, and will continue to do wrong, Alex, <laughs> and all the dangers that lie ahead. But I've also spent the last four months researching influencer marketing, so I wanted to talk briefly about one aspect of the book, what Professor Plunkett calls commercial sharenting. So that includes, with a lot of crossover, uh, mommy bloggers and lifestyle influencers who feature photos of and content about their kids on their posts, including sponsored posts, by way of discussing parenting challenges and more. Kid influencers, who are active participants. The social media account is in their name, and they're the star. So we've got two-year-old twins, Tatum and Oakley. They get $10,000 to $20,000 per sponsored posts. The baby sibling had more than 100,000 followers before even being born. Uh, Seven-year-old Ryan on YouTube has earned over $22 million. And there's been recent coverage regarding middle and high school students who are influencers as their summer job. In chapter five, Professor Plunkett discusses these influencers who feature their kids prominently. She writes, would you farm your kids out to a warehouse to work for free so you could get all the DVDs you want? Clearly not. So why are you comfortable sharing their toilet training dilemmas online to generate revenue for your sharenting enterprise? 
Earlier in that chapter, she points out that a parent would never take out a billboard to announce that their daughter has gotten her period. Yet they might post it in a vlog, which could potentially be seen by far more people all over the world. Influencer marketing right now is a $20 billion in industry, and the value at the core of influencer marketing is authenticity. So it can't be just about the cookie recipes and the best toys to keep kids busy on road trips. More and more, influencers are opening up about their own mental health issues, financial challenges, and parenting struggles. It's hard for a mom influencer to talk authentically about her life and parenting style without mentioning things like potty training methods or talking to adolescents about puberty. And of course, people love pics of adorable kids, and influencers need to get eyeballs. Professor Plunkett talks about the argument that influencers and their kids are just playing a role, but that's belied by those intimate disclosures, as well as kids' limited or non-existent capacity to separate real life from influencer life. A lot of criticism of commercial sharenting is focused on financial exploitation. So decades ago, there were child actors whose parents spent all their money. So laws were enacted in some states requiring employees to put a portion of child actors' income into a trust and requiring contracts to specify the remaining income is the sole property of the child. These same laws often regulate act hours kids can work, provide for education on set, and protect child actors in other ways. But influencer marketing remains mostly unregulated. One aspect I've been writing about is the lack of regulation around false and misleading ad claims delivered by influencers but paid for by major corporations. Another is what happens at the intersection of exploiting children to sell stuff and failing to protect children's privacy or information in the process. It's one thing to think about lay parents sharing pictures or stories that a couple thousand people might be able to piece together or failing to be vigilant about their kids' data privacy the same way we fail at being vigilant about our own data privacy. But the existence of kid influencers and parental influ or parent influencers who share it to millions of followers multiplies these risks exponentially. Professor Plunkett's book is written for parents and pushes them to explore, the, explore these messy questions and become more aware of the trade-offs they're making, like exchanging data for money or services. She doesn't propose legal solutions for parents because the government has little ability when regulating parent, parenting decisions. But when it comes to commercial sharenting, there's an opportunity to advocate for greater responsibility and liability by the brands that hire influencers. That might entail an analog to Coogan laws, which are a thing, <laughs> or legislation limiting companies' ability to use kids to market to other kids. We could see the FTC impose additional requirements for companies that pay for sponsored content, that's SponCon, that features kids, or it might involve pushing social media platforms to more aggressively enforce their own rules, barring kids under 13 from owning and controlling accounts. Professor Plunkett's book clearly has broad and serious implications for parents. As a lawyer, I think it has important implications for regulating advertising as well. Thank you. and her commitment um, to what she does, it was evident in, you know, from that very first conversation. And I've had such the privilege of working with her now in our third year as part of the leadership team of, of the law school. And I can say every single day, um, you know, your passion and your commitment kind of shine through. And um, so reading this book was really interesting because um, you know one of the best things about reading a book that your that your friend writes is reading something that's smart and amazing, but also hearing that person's voice just shine through the book. 
And, you know, I mean, we, we have certain Leahisms, even in my family, we'll talk about, you know, I know something is when it, it's right, it's pitch perfect. And, um, it's true. and <laughs> hearing um, your way with um, the, the way that you characterize things and um, your love of puns and analogies and cultural references um, in always a smart and articulate way is something that just I think I smile the entire time through the book. So some people found it profoundly terrifying, um, and, um, and I, I guess it's that too. But also, it is just a sheer joy to read um, for, for me. Um, and I think that her exploration of, of what she calls you know, the seismic disturbance at the center of our beings um, that's happening in the tech industry right now um, is um, is something that gives us all a lot of questions to think about and starts a lot of conversations for all of us. Um, so I'm really honored to be here to talk a little bit about the book with you and to ask you some questions. Um, so I guess, first of all, um, one of the things I'd like to focus on is this idea of a conversation starter. So you characterize the book as you know not kind of how to fix all the things, but as a way of starting a conversation. So as you, you know, now that the book is published and out, what kinds of conversations do you think you've started? I love that question. Well, a conversation here. I've learned a lot of things tonight. Thank you, everybody who shared your expertise and everyone who's here and hopefully will share questions and reflections over the course of the evening. I've been really interested in seeing the reaction to the book, which seems to be on a spectrum um, between terrifying and entertaining and maybe sort of at different, at different points. And the questions that I've been getting from people have um, focused on a couple of key areas. One is, so what do we do? Um, I have some thoughts. Um, is all hope lost? No. Um, one question that I have gotten a lot, which surprised me, and this has come from friends, from you know people I've met at book talks. It came from a Wall Street Journal reporter last week. Is I feel the question goes something like this: I feel like I or my spouse and I or my partner and I have a pretty good handle on sharing in our home, but the in-laws, grandparents, aunt, uncle whoever doesn't actually have a set of norms or practices that are consistent with ours, I don't know how to have that conversation. I'm getting that question a lot, and I wasn't expecting it. So short of saying, have them read the book, because there's that kind of time-honored tradition of like, oh, this you know, wacky professor I know wrote this book here. Um, you know, drop it off. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what she's talking about. Um, but it, it did prompt me to think a little bit about how we talk about sharenting in a way that is open and authentic, to use Professor Roberts' you know, term, um, but also doesn't shut people down. Because I, I wrote the book out of like eagle arms and yoga, which I guess is another Leahism. Mm -hmm. I do this quite a bit. But um, you know, I joined the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society down at Harvard as a member of their youth and media team at the same time that I was parenting first one, now two young kids. And my work starting at, in 2013 at Berkman Klein was focused at that point on student privacy, but sort of expanded to youth privacy and simultaneously trying to figure out, well, like, I think my kids are hilarious and cute, except when they're crazy and annoying. Um, but like, how do I balance the desire to you know, connect with people I know and people I don't know in terms of sharing that information? How do I balance figuring out, well, I'm busy and only getting busier, so I want Amazon to know everything about me because then they bring me things that I need, but like, oh my gosh, Amazon knows everything about me. And then there's this frustration with Amazon of like, why don't they just anticipate my needs? Why do I have to like actually <laughs> order or set something for delivery, but be much more convenient? Um, so it really was this kind of combination of like, what are the legal research questions? And also, I don't think I understand this personally. And so I need it to be a conversation starter because I need to have the conversation. And so, you know, since the book has been out, I have talked, um, 
down in Cambridge at MIT Press Bookstore. I've gone directly in to talk with librarians. I've talked to New Hampshire Public Radio. I talked to a really nice radio reporter from Australia. I've talked to folks in Wisconsin, Seattle, BBC, which was great because the accents were amazing. Um, but it was very hard as a former improv comedian to listen to the accents and not try to do them myself. I'm really bad at accents, so I didn't do them, but it was like all I could do to be like, don't do it. Um, and, and I think, it, you know, I, I just feel very excited to be able to learn from other people. And John Palfrey, who wrote the foreword to this, which was a real privilege for me. He had helped found the Berkman Klein Center, left the Harvard Law School faculty to be the head of school at Phillips Exeter, and actually just left there to head up MacArthur Foundation. But one of the things that I feel very privileged and honored by in his foreword is he says, this is all changing so fast, it is impossible to pin down how to fix all the things. And it's true. Like I actually keep a running list of all the things that happen that have happened since I've written the book that I wish had happened before, like a smart diaper. It is a real thing. It was not a real thing when I wrote the book, but you can now have a diaper that measures urine output and it's attached to an app. And so th these things are going to continue to change so rapidly um, that I know, right, it, it doesn't do bowel movements yet, so maybe the health <laughs> people can explain the limits of why it's just doing urine. But, um, but it needs to be a, a conversation starter so that all of us can, can figure it out. So that, those are just some of the conversations I've been having about grandparents and poop. You know, I, <laughs> well, you mentioned privacy um, as part of it, and then also John Palfrey's sort of comment that it, that things are changing so so quickly. And it seems to me one of the things that struck me in reading the book is that you know our definition of privacy right. and our understanding of that really has has changed over time. And how critical do you think that is to figuring out where the cultural norms? are in this space? I think it really is important for us to try to pin down what we mean by privacy. And there are so many different options to choose from. The one that- And generational, right. too. I mean, certainly, right. I know that you know a conception of privacy, perhaps, for someone right. 20 years younger than I am seems to be very different than the way Right. I and I think mm -hmm. even within our own lifetimes, and mm -hmm. I sort of, I guess I will share a personal anecdote, but not about my kids, so it's just sharing. It's not sharenting. Mm -hmm. um, I define sharenting as all the ways that parents, teachers, and other trusted adults do things with children's private data online. So this is just my private example. Um, so I started college in fall of 1997, and a few weeks after starting, I got called in to the assistant dean for students or dean of student life office. And I was very confused because I am fundamentally a rule follower. I was like, what did I do? Um, and I got called in because somebody had one of the, a senior boy had made a computer program in his computer science class. Who remembers Telnet? Pine? Yeah. So there was a command you could type into the Pine email program that there was on campus, and the command was finger, and then you'd put the person's username in, and it would tell you where they were on campus. Um, and so one of a senior boy who was in a class with me and his roommate, who was in my improv troupe, I'm not going to say anyone's name, hi camera, um, had started through their computer science class a program that was set up to repeatedly type in the finger command to figure out where whoever they were fingering um, was on campus. And they were they used my name and one of my good friend's names. Um, and the program didn't turn off when they shut off their computer. So it took up so much server space that the IT folks at Harvard College got concerned, um, alerted the dean of student's office, who thought we were being stalked. My brother's in the audience. Did I ever tell you this story? Yeah. Um, so how Sarah and I became good friends. So we get called in. We assure the, the dean of students we're not being stalked. We know these guys. They're fine. We have a conversation with them where they were like, yeah, sorry about that. It was a class assignment. You know, we thought it would be funny to see where you were. Um, and so this was fall of 97. 2004, Facebook is founded at Harvard, right? And so even within my lifetime, it went from dean of students being, I think, legitimately worried that my friend and I were being stalked because there were other people on campus who wanted to know where we were and were using a computer system to do it 
to founding not, I mean, yes, Facebook is huge in and of itself, but revolutionizing this idea that it is not only okay, but actually something we should volunteer, like we should check in, we should tell the world, like I'm at UNH Law, I'm you know here in Cambridge. And so I do think that is happening at lightning speed. And what, what I sort of argue for in the book is that Yes, you can think about privacy as being protectionist or utilitarian or whatever you think about it as, but we need to think about privacy as a protected space where we can vest the creation of our identities. identities. It's a definition I take really from Jonathan Zittrain's work that whatever sort of outer boundaries you want to put on it, if we proceed from a notion that we need some zone of non-interference where we can cause mischief, make mistakes, and experiment to figure out who we are, that's what privacy means to me. But I do worry that in this really warp speed transformation where it goes from it's terrible for someone to use a computer to know where you are online to like we should all use all computers and phones and tablets and watches and drones and who knows smart diapers to know where everyone else is that we're losing this idea of privacy as a protected space to play. Mm -hmm. You know I think about social media often as my um, um, it reminds me of my paternal grandmother who had this remarkable way of you know, making sure all of the family was in touch with, you know, everyone at, at all times. And so she would just, you know, update people and, you know, people lived in different places. And, and I was, have often been the beneficiary of that kind of thing um, because I've not lived with the, you know, close to the, the rest of my extended family. So social media has been such an, uh, an incredible opportunity to sort of connect and, and I have really treated it that way. <laughs> Um, especially with regard to my children, because it's a way for my children, if I'm sharing information about them, and I, I, I posted a, a picture of my son playing soccer this morning, I have no <laughs> hopes or dreams that he would be, a, I was just happy he wasn't picking flowers on the field. Um, but, um, but, so, I'm not going to say that either. Um, so, in that context, it's been so important for, you know, he, the grandparents to feel connected and um, you know how do we as parents navigate that kind of space where we realize that as increasingly with our lives lived you know in large part online and and it's such a you know incredible opportunity this weekend to have our students in the hybrid JD program here with us who we keep having these conversations have developed remarkable human connections with one another um, even though they have spent, you know, less than a week total um, in person. With that need to connect with other human beings increasingly online, how do we not go crazy? Like, what, how do we navigate <laughs> that territory? I propose a thought compass in the book. So I'm not trying to fix all of the things. I'm truly not because I haven't figured it out. But I do think that there are values that we can use to orient ourselves to chart a better way forward. And the values that I think about are the values around play, which I talked a little bit about, that I do think for all of us at any life stage, but particularly for children and adolescents, if you don't have a space to play, then you're really missing out on the ability to develop agency and autonomy and become who you're going to be. The other values I think about, if you're thinking about sort of a compass with cardinal direction, so play, the value that should be placed on forgetting, which Professor Hodder talked about, that we can't move forward sometimes if the past is not forgotten. A premium placed on connecting, which actually sometimes can point toward a desire to share it. And then a premium placed on respect, which Professors uh, Roberts and Price talked about in terms of thinking about, and Professor McCann did too, in terms of monetizing children's um, sort of output as either an influencer or an athlete. And so within the thought compass, I don't advocate a position of, to use kind of bad 1980s public health slogans, this is not a just say no to sharenting book. Mm -hmm. It is a practice safer sharenting book. And so I really encourage people to be thinking, all right, so of these four values, which ideally can coexist, sometimes they may compete, um, what value am I advancing by this choice? And if the answer is that, I really do think that the value of connecting, whether it's with my children or 
connecting my children to their extended family is so well served by mm-hmm. sharing the soccer picture mm-hmm. or whatever else it is, then by all means. Um, but for would any of those values, for instance, be advanced by going with a smart diaper? Mm-hmm. Maybe, or maybe your thought compass has different values. I, I talked about this book in my uh, hometown on Monday, and I had two urologists in the audience. One's a pediatric urologist at um, University of Michigan Hospital. So apparently, I was informed, I think correctly, there can be real health benefits sometimes to tracking urine output. So, um, but unless that applies, um, you know, where on your th- compass of values is a particular sharenting decision going. And I think that is how we might all go not completely crazy, mm-hmm. is if there's a little bit of a practice safer sharenting, think before you click, is this advancing a value or a commitment that is important to me and my family? If it is, go for it. If it's not or you're not sure, maybe just hit pause and try to resist the at times irresistible allure of every swoosh, click, ding, upload. And those technologies are designed to captivate us. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it struck me too that there are so many players that you talk about in the space. So, I mean, the book is about sharenting, but it also implicates, you know, educational institutions and, um, and the legal system. Um, and one of the things I saw on, um, on Twitter just today, um, randomly, was a smart diaper. A, it was this kind of online digital tools uh, consent form for that was given um, in, in a, a county not in the state. But the parents were asked to kind of consent, but it's just this sort of laundry list of you know 50 some odd apps that that the students will be using in elementary school with wildly different kind of terms and conditions. And so, you know, the lawyer brain starts to, um, you know, try to wrestle with that. And one thing that I thought was really helpful in the book, I think in the last chapter, you talk about different models we might use. So thinking about attractive nuisance or public welfare um, laws or um, social welfare laws, public safety and social welfare. Could you explain a little bit about how those kinds of legal frameworks might serve as a model for how we might address these from a policy standpoint? Sure, the, the school example is such an interesting one. I, when I <laughs> talked about the book at MIT Press's bookstore, um, which is the, the publisher, I was joined by a wonderful gentleman who is the chief technology officer for the Cambridge Public School District. And so he was talking about sort of what a difference a good technologist can make. And I had to agree that there are certainly some individual schools or school districts where if you have a wonderful technologist or information officer or privacy officer who actually is going to read all of the terms and conditions um, and not put the onus back on parents, the kids might be safer privacy-wise in the school. But mm-hmm. anyway, so a little, little plug for some of, the, some of the school districts. So the attractive nuisance framework, actually, I don't know if you remember this, Professor McCann, that was your idea um, that made its way into the book. It's so, it's so wonderful no, to, it. yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> well, it, it, yes, it, I think you're even in my footnote. Um, so it's, it's so wonderful to be had conversations that have made its way into the book. So the attractive nuisance framework being that if a property owner, in this case a digital property, has something that they know is going to be irresistible um, to a child often, but it can be a grown up as well, that they have a heightened duty to protect it or face liability. And I'm painting with a very broad brush. I have, right next to Professor McCann, I have our property expert, Professor Hearn, who could give you a much better explanation. But um, painting with a broad brush, it's this idea that if you know that someone is going to come want to play in your abandoned well or empty pool, put a fence around it. And I talk about in the book that we are not doing a good job now of building fences around digital common spaces. Mm -hmm. And that one of the things we should be working on, both from a potentially sort of a do not go there, build a fence to keep out, but also a, okay, so let's try to shift people from wanting to play in the empty pool, which in my analogy would be just throwing kids' private information out there, not caring where it goes, to can we create 
protected spaces of kind of a digital playground or a digital space so that if you're putting your kids' information in it, you can be confident that it will be protected. And something I talk about in the book that kind of builds off of this idea <laughs> is to move from you know, we have sort of YouTube kids, which actually recently got in a lot of regulatory trouble, but we have versions of social media platforms or other digital products that are supposed to be kid friendly. What about saying, let's have versions of these products that are parent friendly? So you and I could choose the parent protected version of Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. If Facebook wanted to come out with that, where they would bake into the way it's designed. They would protect us from ourselves. They would fence off the attractive nuisance kind of cesspool of just throwing the digital data in and instead say, okay, you know, the soccer picture is super cute, the Elsa dress picture is super cute, and they are super cute, right? Um, and, and I will just say, I mean, many of you are my, like, I have social media accounts, I share it. I mean, you know, I, I, I definitely don't just say no. Um, but what if, what if Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or the fertility tracking app or the sports stats app had a parent protected version so that the data auto deletes after a certain period of time and not just from the news feed but actually an enforceable promise that it deletes from whatever repository of data there is. What about something that is visible in terms and conditions that promises never to reshare it with a data broker or a third party that is going to use it for anything other than providing basic support for the service. So I think there are ways that we can look to attractive nuisance mm -hmm. or public welfare and safety laws to protect us from ourselves, and by us I mean the grown-ups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, on Friday, the New York Times released an investigation into how photos of children that are posted on social media by Sharon's are feeding facial recognition databases. And the article asks, who could have possibly predicted that a snapshot of a toddler in 2005 would contribute a decade and a half later to the development of bleeding edge surveillance technology? So the question's rhetorical, but the answer really is that Sharon Hood could have predicted that. Um, you know, near future hypotheticals and realistic but fictional thought experiments are really central to the approach that you take in the book. Could you tell us some more about um, you know, some of those scenarios, and then also why you chose to use those devices to, um, to address the topic. Maybe I'll start with the last part of the question and then give an example of a scenario. So, um, yeah, the New York Times didn't cite me. I was really bummed. I read that question. I was like, come on, guys, my book's right here. Um, so, you know, it, part of it, and this is another Leahism, so forgive me, the one Donald Rumsfeld quote that I will say, you know, it's like someone needs like a bingo or a drinking game for every time I say it. Um, for hybrid students who are working with me tomorrow for two hours, rest assured at some point I will say it in our two-hour class together, is that there are known unknowns. And we know right now that sharenting is almost entirely unregulated by the law, certainly by parents, unless what you're posting violates a law of general applicability like criminal law. So you can't, heaven forbid, abuse or neglect your child and have it be protected by sharenting. But really, other than that, you know, social security numbers, you know, pictures and diapers, whatever it is, have at it. And other adults, so teachers and grandparents and aunts and uncles, there may be some pockets of greater regulation like in schools, but it's pretty wide open. So part of why I use hypotheticals and near future scenarios and Professor Hodder, without actually knowing that this question was going to come up, cued me up for this, so thank you, um, is that we are, this book as part of the conversation, it is designed to say to people, we are creating this kind of wild west open season on data that adults share about the kids in their lives. And we should expect, and we know in pockets, and the New York Times expose on Friday was just the latest in the long line of revelations. If you haven't read that one, that was an expose into how social media pictures going back to 2005 have been used to build facial surveillance databases that are just now being found out about. And a lot of them were kids' photos. But we should expect, because we know that it's open season, and we know that private information is the currency in the digital world, that there are an unknown number of creepy things happening by tech providers, data brokers, government officials, and, and so on. And so what I, one thought experiment I have, and the one that Professor Hodder referred to, I'll read briefly, 
is a near future hypothetical scenario. You're helping your 17 year old daughter finish her college applications. The applications require her SAT score, SAT2 scores, AP scores, and Tykebytes personal capital scores. What the heck is Tykebytes? Siri tells you that Tykebytes serves as, quote, your child's passport from her past to her future. You ask Siri to stop reading the Tykebytes sound bites and do some digging. The response, Tykebytes is a commercial database that serves as a repository of childhood data at a clearinghouse into adulthood. Tykebytes aggregates as much data about each child in the country as possible and then packages the data for purchase by different types of institutions and individuals. The most popular product is a set of scores that rates children's likelihood of future success in a range of areas, including education, athletics, and employment. Tykebytes will share these personal capital scores with any individual or institution that pays for them, isn't legally prohibited from having them, and demonstrates what is, in Tykebytes' opinion, a legitimate need for them. You and your daughter don't need to do anything to have these scores sent. All colleges that receive applications from her will get these scores at no cost to individual applicants. Tykebytes does allow parents and youth age 18 or over to opt out of having Tykebytes collect and share information. But the Tykebytes website warns you that opting out risks your child's future. After all, the perky chatbot in the click here for help section tells you, an applicant without Tykebyte scores is like a car without airbags. You could take it for a spin, but why risk it? And so we're basically there, right? I mean, it, I don't think that particular product exists. At least it didn't when I wrote the book. I haven't Googled it recently. Um, I should potentially see if I should like trademark that name or something. I don't know. We'll, we can talk later, maybe, um, both of you. Um, but. You know, we, we see it in so many ways already. Actually, the um, USTA, the Tennis Association, has a predictive algorithm to predict young players' likelihood of success. Sorry, you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> you were out. You were totally out, right? Um, you know, Ch <laughs> China is doing social capital scoring. Um, this, is, this is not a make-believe sort of fairy tale scenario. And so this type of scenario, though, is where I would favor, if at all possible, and it's probably a, a dream, um, a sort of federal legal and regulatory response. Mm -hmm. But I will, I will stop there. Okay. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So. Um, what questions do you all have? Yes. Yeah. Do you think this is all going to change, or will not change, until the freemium business model of big tech gets um, either through the market or through policy changes? Because that's a source of people are just used to not paying and you know the internet wasn't like that in the beginning it started in 2000 the gmail was actually the first that shifted because people don't remember this you used to pay for email service yeah. i think i paid for hotmail yeah is that right did i probably pay for hotmail yeah yeah and, and a second sub to that is is it time for a digital bill of rights like we did with the patient bill of rights which took two decades, but. Yes, and yes, I think, um, <laughs> to, to both of those. I think that we don't see that we are paying for free or low cost services with data. And one of the things I do talk about in the book is given that we can pay for it with any type of data, maybe we should pay for it with data that is less private and doesn't belong to our kids, whenever possible, right? There are times when, when we can't, but if, if at all possible, maybe we should. Um, but I, I do absolutely think that as long as that is the currency of so many of the technologies both products and services that we take for granted, we are in a really tough place. A Bill of Rights would go a long way, um, but it, I, I don't have a lot of faith in the ability to get market-based solutions. I feel like we've been moving further away from that um, since the early days of the internet, but I, I, welcome, um, I welcome reflections or, or disagreement or additions. Yeah, Ken? Well, on that, um, I agree with you, I think, to expect a market-based solution is to ignore that the core business model of some of these companies is this. And if you simply 
said you can't do that, then huge companies will go to, I mean, there's going to be huge money behind fighting against something like that. Um, but one point that, you know, Professor Minkas mentioned the other day, yesterday, was um, there's so much data that really the only place it can sit is in cloud uh, repositories. And there are five companies that control the overwhelming majority of that. So they seem like a right target, even though Microsoft hasn't been listed, uh, along with the others lately. Um, and he was sort of smiling at that fact. Um, regulating, first, making AWS the, the best of, making Amazon's best of AWS, and then taking the five and saying, to the extent you operate here at least, um, we're going to treat you like utilities. Mm -hmm. And then drive these kinds of regulations. I, I don't see if you don't do that. I, again, to get the political will is going to be complicated, given the money that we'll be fighting it. But um, is, is, there, is that a strategy that you've thought about? Or Because right now, uh, the Senate, who didn't know how Facebook works, for example, right, <laughs> yeah. um, are theoretically looking for ways to regulate. Is this something that um, why don't you go first? I know you probably heard Professor Minhas. Yes. So uh, Professor Mickey Minhas is the also um, is a wonderful member of our faculty and also the chief patent counsel for Microsoft. So he was here teaching yesterday. So I didn't hear his remarks, but I appreciate your sort of <coughs> summarizing them. I am very intrigued by the potential crossover between the antitrust um, sort of wave that is sweeping around big tech and privacy. I will confess that I have not done the scholarly research to see sort of from a very nuts and bolts law nerd way what this sort of interplay might be. I would think it would stand to reason, painting with a very broad brush, that if you move away from a model of control by sort of a big five of being these sort of warehouses of private data that you would have a better ability in terms of passing new statutory laws or new regulations or even new enforcement actions to really kind of connect what those companies were doing with what the increasingly, I think, popular will is toward privacy. But I have not figured out yet, and, and if anyone in this room has ideas, we have a lot of very smart people in this room, I have not figured out exactly what the hook would be, but I would expect that there could be one. But it occurred to me when you were saying making them right. accountable for the attractive nuisance factor. Yes. Mm -hmm. that the fences are going to be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Professor Price? Are you fundamentally optimistic or pessimistic about this? <laughs> are they going to be better or worse oh, with, I, with respect to this? I was hoping you were going to answer the antitrust question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have called in you. Um, I, <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. Um, I am fundamentally optimistic, but that's just because I'm an optimistic person. I think that actually if you look at the sort of objective trajectory and take out sort of my own personal glasses half full nature, I'm, there's a lot to be more pessimistic about than optimistic really because we don't have a way to hit the brakes on something like tyke bites or ways in which data about our kids before they're even born gets aggregated, analyzed, acted upon in ways that we as parents have no insight into and no control over. So while I am optimistic about the increasing, I think, public will toward better data privacy, better cybersecurity, you know, potential sort of ant use of antitrust to break up big tech monopoly power, I think there are a lot of really optimistic sentiments and conversations like these make me optimistic until we also have the ability to have some overlay of not just state legal action or regulatory action, but actual federal statutory reform around privacy, I, am, I think I should probably be a little bit pessimistic. Mm -hmm. To combine sort of both of the things I think that you, you know, both of the last questions, um, one of the things that came up in the class yesterday was talking about the aggregation of data for um, the benefit to level the to sort of benefit the public welfare and safety and um, counteract the influence of big companies. So, for example, I think there was some discussion of using AI, which you talk about, um, you know, at, um, in some detail in the book, um, to you know 
perhaps deal with um, autonomous cars and safety. And so if there's sort of the aggregation of data um, from different, um, you know, different automobile companies, then you know, Toyota that would have a huge market share wouldn't want that, all that data to be aggregated because they would want their own proprietary data. But the smaller car companies would like to see that because you would have the benefit of greater safety right. and you could create safer products if you have the aggregation of, of data. So I'm wondering if in some ways um, the optimism can also be connected with, with AI, which can be part of the problem, but potentially mm -hmm. also part of an architectural infrastructure solution. I like yeah. that. Yeah. I, I like the grounds for optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I will always look for those. We had a couple of more hands yeah. out there before we wrap up. Yeah. I, um, I'm not a parent, but uh, I'm an international student, and this seems like a global problem. And uh, I was wondering if you're planning on uh, adjusting your book into the European <coughs> uh, regulations, because I think the GDPR can influence Sharon to it in, in a different perspective than mm -hmm. in, uh, here in the United States. <coughs> so I was wondering if you plan on doing that, and if you plan on making any comments with Sharon to it about the California Privacy Act and the regulations that, are, that came out recently right. for that. Wonderful, wonderful questions. So the uh, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, which went into effect in the European Union in May of 2018, is far better on privacy than anything we have here. And California, as is often the case, is at the vanguard on the state level when it comes to rolling out a new, privacy, a new consumer privacy law that I believe goes into effect in January of 2020. So there, the timing of when the book was written was such, and the text had to be finished, was such that I did not, both by design, I was trying to stay US focused. So I have just a couple of pages on GDPR. And then with California, it sort of wasn't as far along when I actually had to finalize the text. I do think that Sharon Hood 2, my son told me he was going to write, he was going to write Sharon Hood 2 and put a poop emoji on the cover. This is an actual conversation. And I said, why? Because you think Sharon Ding is so stinky. He said, no, because maybe grown ups share pictures of kids' poop. And then we had to stop talking. Um, but, um, but I do actually think that for um, the book that comes next, a a comparative perspective and also a deeper drilling down into the states would be very valuable. Two very quick reflections now. So it is a little bit unclear to me if GDPR actually, as it is written on its face, um, would necessarily stop parents from sharenting with kids who are below the age of consent in their member countries. It doesn't look to me like it does. And I've asked a couple of GDPR experts, um, and I haven't gotten a firm answer. So GDPR is great in terms of, and again, I'm going to paint with a very broad brush, a right to be forgotten or a right to erasure once you are sort of at the age of majority and you can request removal. Um, but it actually isn't clear to me at all. And in fact, my best reading, and again, keeping in mind I'm not an international privacy scholar, is that GDPR actually would not protect a child under the age of consent for data sharing in a member country um, if that child wanted to stop a parent from deciding to share something about that child. So even, and, and, and similarly, in some of the state laws that we've seen develop, again, California's on the vanguard, but we have also seen in states across the country um, since, I believe, 20, between 2013 to 2018, we saw 42 states consider 300 bills and 25 states pass 59 new laws on student data privacy. So that's sort of the biggest area of youth data privacy focus. A lot of those laws still are putting parents in a role of consenting or not consenting unless an exception applies. Some of them do a better job and actually regulate the tech companies directly and sort of take parents out of the picture, which I think is probably better. But I think as long as either individual states or um, national or transnational regulations are keeping parents as the decision maker rather than regulating at the level of a tech company and saying to the tech company, even if you get the data legitimately, there is a whole list of things that you cannot do with it under any circumstances unless you have a very specific consent 
from either a parent if you're dealing with a minor, although I might move it to 16 for a minor, um, or a child if you're dealing you know, with 18 or over, and that the child um, through a guardian or once they attain the age of majority should be able to revoke that. So in other words, I would want to see a law that says, okay, tech companies, um, if you get information about a minor, bless you, under, under 18, I don't care what source you get it from, you cannot use it for marketing, advertising, or to make decisions about that child's life opportunities. And you could sort of define what those life opportunities were at any point in the child's life, even once they're 18. If you got it about them when they were a minor, unless there was a very clear and very specific opt-in for a particular use, like the tennis algorithm, you can't have it. And then you give a private right of action to the child that they can enforce through a parent or through a guardian or a next friend that would actually start when they were a minor and continue once they were an adult in case it turns out that their college application was negatively impacted by the fact that they wet their bed till they were five, um, so they could actually collect damages for that. And, and you, had a, you had a question. I did. It was actually sort of along oh. those lines, actually. So it's nice. Um, when I'm looking at sort of not data as individual data points or even certain data that we don't want people to have access to, but rather what we're using as an analytic. That's something that gets very concerning for me and how that analytic can be used and what rights we might have to potentially fight that analytic. Mm -hmm. And I brought that up only because I was sharing with uh, my friends, colleagues, whatever we are. <laughs> um, uh, they have patent examiner statistics, for example. I'm a supervisory patent examiner uh, at the office. And there are judgments about me and um, what people might think or infer of my behavior, which could adversely affect me later on after I get out of here based on whatever someone might be judging. And it doesn't seem like I have any right to say, hey, I'm not sure that you're looking at these slices of data the, the right way or it's even um, supporting the conclusions that you might be coming to in this nice chart that I see. It's the type base for the USPTO. It's the type base for the USPTO, right? And, and at this point, we're still in a setup where your right to access that and to query it is going to be very sector specific. It's going to depend on, you know, whether there would be some sort of regulation or policy in your specific space, or I guess a, a federal law or a state law, that would give you the ability to request access, not just to what the analytics say about you, but what the underlying algorithm, which may well be proprietary, right, um, what that algorithm is, is spitting out. And there are some, you know, pockets where we are seeing that. And, and of course, I should also say, um, you know, I am, I am married to a ferocious litigator who would, would have me say that, of course, you know, give any of these problems to a high-octane litigator and go back to your basic principles of contract law and sort of, you know, employment contracts and policies and all of that and, you know, try to have it out on an individual basis. And so giving that law nerd sort of caveat for you know, there can always be creative theories if you're litigating an individual dispute with a great attorney. As you're thinking about an overarching approach, it's still really sector specific and we don't have good protection, even as grown-ups, for determining a, you know, in a blanket sort of way what types of analytics are being used about us by the different decision makers in our lives, be those in, in an employment context, in an insurance context, in a credit, credit's a little bit better, you have access to a credit report, still not great. So, yeah, there and then there. This book is making me look at my children's lives who are now are 21, 19, and 12, and what I have done. <laughs> <laughs> not the intention, not the intention. But, <laughs> but I, I like to take a derivative of this Please. and um, see and through my own kids' eyes what another way. Mm -hmm. For example, eight years ago, we used to post on Picasso, and we don't use that anymore. Um, my 19-year-old does not use Facebook refuses to, um, not because she doesn't like it, she doesn't just use it, it's old. Um, well, thanks. And, and, Picasso, <laughs> um, uh, and the question is then this way, Have, does the data show anything about app exhaustion in that um, 
that technology may actually be going so fast mm -hmm. that it'll actually outdate itself and the regulation may not be able to be implemented in time to catch right. up with the change. Yes, that is a huge problem. It was, I mean, it's probably even at a very mini level in writing this book, right? That between the time when the editors pried it out of my hands and when it actually came into the world, a lot changed. And so I think that there, that's why sort of I think a future regulation and certainly statutory reform would have to be done in a fairly broad brush way so that you were not tying it to technologies that were in existence at a particular point in time. And I think that is a, a chronic structural problem with regulating digital technology is, you know, you start talking about the internet and all of a sudden we have apps. You start talking about apps and all of a sudden we have artificial intelligence and smart devices. And so that's one of the big structural reasons that law has tended to lag behind technology as a solution space. Your question also brings up, I think, um, another problem or maybe even paradox that, so you talk about using outdated apps or storage platforms. So somewhere there's some tech provider that, you know, has the pictures, could access the pictures, may have been extracting data from the pictures, may have had some sort of security breach where now someone else has your pictures, but you don't have the pictures because you've forgotten the login, you've forgotten you used it, you never printed out hard copies. So it's this weird tension that the digital world may be remembering, and I don't necessarily mean humans looking at them, but data brokers or you know derivative companies that have picked it up, where maybe your 19-year-old daughter can't find the pictures you took of her when she was 10 um, because who knows where, I mean this is a problem in my house and my kids are younger like I have the whole bunches of pictures um, they're somewhere in the internet I'm not quite sure what they are. The irony is you know what app she actually prefers is snap and they don't save anything. Right of course okay, and she prefers it because no, they I don't know, No, I know the server doesn't save anything but uh, it's supposed to not to I right. understand that but the point is initially they're deleting it right, right. Uh, so maybe it'll handle itself. And I think Facebook yeah, is actually, Facebook's already experimenting. I think they want to have a similar right. platform with only 100 stories and that deletes as well, right? right. Uh, I don't know. And I think, and I'll, I'll take this question, then we'll wrap us up and have some dessert. I think, you know, I, part of it is there's, there's always, there will always be humans at the other end. And so I think at this point it sounds quaint and old fashioned, but things can be screenshotted and saved and reshared even, even with snaps. So it never really goes away. And this is also where we still don't have, especially with a company like Facebook, really good transparency into what they themselves are doing, what third parties are doing. I mean, you just kind of wait to open. Oh, sorry, AJ, I hit the microphone. I wasn't supposed to touch. Um, <laughs> I got a specific warning. Um, you know, you just wait for the next scandal for Facebook in particular. So last question. So this is a much less technical question. Uh, you talk a lot in the book about wanting to allow our children to make mistakes and then allow them to leave them in the past and move on as adults. What I see on social media is sort of a countervailing pressure, which is, be more real, show the messy stuff, think about adolescent girls in particular that are bombarded with these images of perfection that have really no relevance in real life. And so I'm wondering, what do you think the, not the mood of those of us in this room who are reading your book and thinking about these things, but the mood of the everyday social media user? Are people moving in a direction of being more attentive to to privacy or more inclined to, to share even more so that social media becomes less curated. Quick show of hands. Who thinks people are moving towards more privacy? Okay. Depends on the age. Yeah, fair enough, Professor Hearn. Who who thinks people are um, having the other option sort of being more curated, right? Yeah. Oh I'm sorry, more. sharing more, sharing more. Sorry. But, but, but yeah. In what context I mean so they're sharing viewpoints, right? right? That I think people are doing more and more. Maybe they're not sharing an image, but right. yeah, I think like Marcus was saying, it kind of depends on the context of the sharing, right? Right. I think. If you look at TikTok, I think they're sharing. I'm scared to look at TikTok. That's <laughs> I saw my daughters yesterday and we had a talk. I mean, it's, but I'll bet your parents are starting to do that too. Yeah. It's getting too weird. There's many, way too many things that are being posted yeah. that shouldn't be. And it's causing, at least in my world, to go away from it rather yeah. than go toward it. I I think I love I I love these these answers in this debate. And Sarah, I think it really does vary at the level of different types of networks or communities, 
right, that there are a lot of people um, starting to think maybe more thoughtfully and strategically about do I really need to preserve, you know, the toilet training struggle or the temper tantrum for posterity? And at the same time, there are people who are taking a bit of a privacy fatigue and just sort of, well, it's all going to be out there anyway. And I don't, I don't think that we have landed completely. Um, I will say that when it comes to what kids think about adults, I think they think we have a lot to learn. Um, I, a Microsoft research team, actually, to go back to Professor Minhas, just came out with a study this week that was saying of a survey they did, and I think it was international, actually, of teens' perspectives on sharenting, which they were defining somewhat more narrowly. I define it to include you know, the smart diapers, the surveillance technology, but it's commonly defined just to include social media, um, that it was definitely, it was 40 plus percent of the teens surveyed thought that parents had a problem and that we were doing it wrong. And I, you have to allow for some aspect of just every generation thinks that. But I do have to say, I, I think that kids now may really have a point. Because while there are some, I will say, younger parents who um, you know, didn't go to college when the email system was Telnet, um, a lot of us who are parents now did not grow up with any of this. And so we're figuring it out at the same time as our kids are, or maybe even more slowly than our kids are. And so this may be, I shouldn't say the one area, but one of the areas where listening more and learning from our kids may hold more answers than we think. There are some schools now that are either voluntarily, or in the case of at least one state, Washington State, which in 2016 passed a law requiring primary and secondary public schools to teach digital citizenship, that our kids have a uniquely thoughtful perspective on this. So I, I think that there may be, um, in addition to sort of thinking about what is the general mood, there may be different generational moods as well. And so I think we should probably wrap up and go have some dessert in the IP rotunda. And there are um, books available. Um, Yes, um, yes, yeah, books of, okay, do you want to say anything? I usually don't have a voice, um, but I will say thank you all for coming out on a holiday weekend. Special thanks to Professor Roberts, who has worked so hard to make this happen. She lost her voice, and <laughs> to AJ and John McLennan and everyone who spoke and everyone working security, and to all of you for sharing reflections. This has been great. Thank you, Megan, for the Thank interview. you.